Hello and welcome to our webinar, Future Proofing Inflammatory Bowel Disease Diagnosis and Clinical Trials. Today's webinar is being co-hosted by Dr. Mark Goldfinger of Perspectum, Dr. Corey Roberts of ProPath, and Dr. Jack Snyder of Cato SMS. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. If you would like to submit a question, we will address them at the end of the webinar as time allows. For any unanswered questions, we will be following up within the five following business days. Please submit your questions using the bottom panel of your Zoom screen by clicking on the Q&A option. You may be prompted to participate in a brief survey at the end of this webinar. We thank you in advance for your response. Now we will begin with the webinar, Dr. Mark Goldfinger of Perspectum. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, um, so in today's webinar, we're going to be touching on several topics, including challenges in IBD clinical trials, as well as aspects of imaging and histology in the diagnosis of IBD, as well as the changing designs in IBD clinical trials, as well as the evolution of FDA expectations in IBD product development. And my name is Dr. Mark Goldfinger, and I work at Perspectum in Inflammatory Bowel Disease. So we all know IBD or inflammatory bowel disease is an umbrella term for a spectrum of GI conditions. We have ulcerative colitis, which mainly affects the rectum and large colon, and Crohn's disease, which can go beyond the large colon into the small colon and beyond. And right now, there's an estimated 3 million people reported diagnosed with IBD in the US and 620,000 in the UK. And these are rising rapidly. But when we compare this, what's happening in the clinic, in the United Kingdom, in the NHS, we see this, it often costs around £10,000 per patient. And in the United States, it often costs around $22,000 per patient per year. Now, this is exorbitant. But what are the symptoms that we're seeing in IBD? Well, mainly these are gut-based symptoms, like diarrhea, fatigue, cramping, but they can go beyond the bowel like weight loss, and we can see fistulas. And these can often result in flares, and they can lead to hospitalization, which can average a stay of four to six days. But what's important is that this can lead to complications outside of the gut, including the liver, the kidney, the heart, and even cancer. Now, when we're assessing IBD within the clinic, we often use a myriad of tests, including blood, stool, histology, endoscopy, imaging, and even how treatments affect the disease. But this is slightly different when we're looking in an IBD clinical trial. We often use and focus on three technologies, endoscopy, pathology, and MR or CT interrography. Now, endoscopy is often thought of as the gold standard for assessing IBD, and this plays a fundamental role in the diagnosis, as well as monitoring of the gut mucosa and how well a drug can affect the healing of the gut mucosa. But we often use pathology as a way to assess the inflammatory response beyond the surface of the gut. And we often use MR and CT enterography to visualize beyond the bowel and especially in the small bowel of patients with, with Crohn's disease. But what we find in inflammatory bowel disease is there's a wide variety of variability, subjectivity, and issues with regulatory bodies. Now we know that the current methods, especially with endoscopy and MR technology, results in quite a variety of inter and intraoperative variability. Now when we look at histology, there's often quite a massive amount of high inter and intraoperative variability, as well as heterogeneity, within the processing of biopsy slides. Now, when we look at the FDA and EMA, they're often out of touch with the pace at which technology is advancing. Now, the question is, how do we address these? Now, if we think of endoscopy, we know that there are advantages to using endoscopy in inflammatory bowel disease trials. So it gives us a visual assessment of disease severity. You can perform endoscopic mucosal biopsies, as well as you can follow individual bowel segments. But the limitations are that they're invasive, it's quite high costs. Again, the variability that we see, and as well as you can't really re reach remote intestinal segments. And to further compound this, as we see that there's a multitude of different endoscopy scoring systems, 
For ulcerative colitis, there's more than 30. For Crohn's, there's more than nine. And then the question is, do you use the one that's the most common or the one that's the most validated? But we see more and more within different settings that using computer-aided de detection and artificial intelligence, we can improve the way that we assess the gut. And we've seen countless times the way computer-aided detection and uh, has affected and improved polyp detection, as well as video capsule endoscopy, as well as endocytoscopy. But what's really exciting is the advancements of neural networks. These have exploded onto the scene. And what we're seeing is advancements across the gamut that allow us to assess and characterize and categorize changes within the gut mucosa. Now, what this allows us to do is create standardized, quantitative ways of assessing changes. Now, here at Perspectum, we've created a convoluted neural network which can score images based on their Mayo score. So what we can do is take an image or a video, which can possibly be scored by a human. And once we put this into our unique classifier, which removes artifacts like bubbles and saturation and blur, blur and tools, it can correctly identify the output. So is this Mayo score zero, one, two, or three? We can also do the same for the UC EIS scoring system. Well, we see that this has also been done in many different types of neural networks. And one of them, importantly, is the red density algorithm, which is being put forward by Peter Bassut, which is looking at the redness in the gut and how it's related to different classifying systems like histology, like the robots histology index. But we also see convoluted neural networks being used in the Stidham group, which can categorize videos and images into two groups, remission on Mayo 01 or moderate or severe disease Mayo 23. Now, what we're seeing are computers and artificial intelligence obfuscating the need for the inter and intra readers that produce so much variability. As well, these can be used as adjunctive diagnostic tests that readers can use to help themselves make correct diagnoses and, and assess changes uh, more accurately. But when we're looking at endoscopy, we know that we can go beyond looking at the surface of the gut. And this is especially true for MR techniques in inflammatory bowel disease. Now we know that these are mostly used for Crohn's disease and not really in ulcerative colitis, but what actually MR allows us to do is visualize hard to reach areas like the small bowel. We can identify macroscopic complications and we can distinguish between fibrosis and inflammation, which is incredibly important. But we know that some of the major disadvantages for MR is that it can be costly. And we often need things like contrast to assess bowel wall thickening. And to make matters worse, there's a multitude of semi-quantitative scores which can often be complex and quite difficult to assess. The question is, do you use the CDMI, the MARIA score, the simplified MARIA score? And this is exactly where Perspectum can help you. Now, we have many years of experience within MR technology. Traditionally, Perspectum can be thought of as a liver company. But over the past few years, we've been branching into other aspects of diseases like cancer or diabetes or inflammatory bowel disease. And we know exactly how to implement MR tech into your clinical trials and improve them. So like I said before, we know that MR tech can in, uh, visualize hard to reach areas of the bowel. And it is non-invasive, it's patient friendly, and it can be used for enhanced stratification as well as accelerated enrollment. But we can use our in-house technologies like Corrected T1, which can look at other organs. And we know that inflammatory bowel disease can affect our organs outside of the gut. And employing these in your clinical trial can enhance your assessment of disease. But to, to further this, we can leverage our existing uh, insight network, which we have over 300 sites across the globe. And because we have a multitude of collaborations in imaging partners, we can get reductions of more than 50% on your MR and CT exams in your clinical trials across the United States. But what this all leads to is a more quantitative, standardized approach to the exams and gives precision imaging to your trial. Now, what we're able to do, again, like I said, is using other aspects of MR technology to assess organs outside of the gut.
Now here at the Spectrum, we've developed two tools, liver multiscan, which can assess fibrotic and inflammatory changes within the liver, as well as MRCP+, which can quantitatively assess changes within the biliary tree. What we've been able to do in patients with primary sclerosis and cholangitis, which is uh, quite high in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, is use these together to offer unparalleled access to changes within the liver and biliary tree. Now, what we can do is look at CT1 or corrected T1, which shows us in, uh, inflammation and fibrosis and its relationship to strictures and dilatations within the biliary tree. Now, what we noticed is that in patients with IBD and PSC, we found that there was increased inflammation and fibrosis, which was periductal. So it surrounded the biliary tree. And what this looked like was increasing fibrosis and inflammation, which looked very similar to onion skinning, onion skinning, which is a histological hallmark feature of primary sclerosis and cholangitis. But what CT and MR enterography can do is really enhance precision medicine through assessment of structural changes. It can evaluate the damage used uh, in Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis uh, using imaging. We can look at bowel wall thickness, bowel dilatations, as well as improving our assessment of these changes. So we know that automated segmentation can be more precise and is usually a better measurement of thickness than what manual segmentations can offer. But I would be remiss to not discuss one of the most important aspects of clinical trials in inflammatory bowel disease, and that would be pathology. We know that endoscopy is key for assessing the mucosal wall and, uh, and, and assessing gut healing. And we can use MR to go beyond the wall, beyond the gut. But when we want to assess changes that we can't see in a microscopic fashion, pathology is a must. And we know that if we can combine these assessments together, we can create biomarkers, which give us a much better assessment of changes as a result of treatments in inflammatory bowel disease. And further to this, we know histology is a better predictor of clinical relapse and itself can be a distinct target of mucosal healing, apart from what we see in endoscopy. So when we're assessing these changes, it's important to understand what your clinical trial is asking and what you want to see. We know that we can improve endoscopy through the use of AI and computer-aided detection, and we can improve beyond the gut using MR technology. And all of this can paint a much richer picture of what exactly is happening as a result of your drug. Now, to, uh, my colleague who's going to discuss uh, pathology a bit further is the CEO of ProPath, Dr. Corey Roberts. So I'm gonna hand it off to him. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. Yeah, my name is Corey Roberts, and I'm a GI and liver pathologist by training uh, based here in Dallas with ProPath. So I'm a uh, pleasure to speak with you all. So if we just continue on, while I'm here to advocate for pathology and histology and the importance in your clinical trials, let's start with some of the shortcomings. A lot of people have the misconception that uh, a lab is a lab and a slide is a slide, and that couldn't be further from the truth. There's a wide heterogeneity in processing of those slides. Uh, these are uh, human systems, and therefore human error is involved. So the quality um, and technique is very, very important, and that varies from, um, from lab to lab and person to person. Traditionally, what we've been doing for many years and continue to do is rely on glass slides, and that uh, creates some... Um, time problems and it, can, it certainly creates some expense issues because those slides have to be stored and they have to be shipped one place to another and all of those things take time and money. And finally, with regard to inflammatory bowel disease specifically, there is, uh, as Mark has mentioned in other instances, wide inter and intra observer variability in reading those slides. So the, the physician behind the microscope reading the case is far more important than any other piece of equipment in making sure the diagnosis is accurate. And of course, that relies uh, on the training of that physician and then inclusion of the proper patients and treatment. As we look at IBD in general, you're well aware that uh, this is a difficult disease to diagnose, and, and this uh, survey of over 4,000 patients illustrates some of those features. So as you can see, 57% of patients were misdiagnosed. Almost a third were diagnosed as IBS or, or irritable bowel syndrome instead of IBD. 
Uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are often confused one with another, and it takes a while to get diagnosed with 62% taking greater than five office visits. So this disease is challenging and therefore quality at every step of the way is critical in order to get it right the first time. And further, pathology, as I'll illustrate later, is becoming a real focus of the FDA and I think soon to be the EMA as well. As we look here, you can see the traditional part of pathology remains, um, and that is that unlike radiology, we cannot skip directly to digital images. We still have to produce the glass slides. So the biopsy collection and process and logistic delivering of those specimens to a lab is critical. We have a tracking system here at ProPath where we track the specimen from time of pickup to arrival in our lab, and then every step of the way throughout the lab to the physician that reads the case. Um, so the, that provides for some security and guaranteeing of consistent results. If you add whole slide imaging and digitization of the slides, you can see that illustration in the middle where the crypts are being highlighted. The slides then can be annotated, written directly on those images. So we're not relying anymore on markers on glass slides or separate Excel spreadsheets with detailed information. That can be all put directly with the image and shared real time with anyone, anywhere and multiple groups of people at the same time. You layer on AI algorithms on top of that, and you're able to more accurately assess the features of IBD that are critical and take some of the human element out of it. If we look here, this is actually a picture of uh, the scanner that we use, which is the Leica Perio AT2. Um, it's a great scanner. The images then um, are quickly scanned, quickly stored securely. Um, we, you can use Perspectum's secure portal and their imaging platform um, that is HIPAA compliant, can be downloaded to the appropriate people at any time and, and visualized. The traditional workflow is shown here, and, and uh, the first part of this you'll see is the same on my next slide, but that is biopsy is taken and has to be shipped. But if it's going to multiple labs, that increases that delay and increases that variability that I mentioned. The slides are prepped and stained, then they're delivered to the CRO pathologist. And if additional reviews are required, you have to ship those glass slides around that uh, route and however many times you want to do that, or gather people together all at one place, both costly and time consuming delivery of reports, and then storage of those glass slides. However, as we go forward with the digital workflow, that first part remains. We still have to make those glass slides. The importance of having that quality glass slide production remains. Uh, however, from there, if slides are imaged um, and uh, scanned as we do here at ProPath, those can be delivered to anyone, anywhere, immediately, and collaboration can take, take place real time and quickly and significantly cut time out of a trial. In addition, the reports are scored, are, uh, uh, stored securely and available securely through the Perspectum portal, and, and the images are stored in the cloud. Again, easy retrieval without long drawn out retrieval processes. This shows uh, what we like to refer to with Perspectum as our vial to file solution. So that slide prep that I've mentioned, but then immediately requiring that whole slide image um, is, is such a benefit to everybody involved. It speeds up the process, allows for any, experts anywhere you want to read the cases and to read them at the same time. Computer gener generated metrics can be re uh, acquired and reports created, uploaded securely into the cloud, then downloaded at, a, at request uh, for all appropriate people and uh, able to handle all of that data at the same time, multiple times without waiting on glass slides or people for that matter. Just briefly, if we talk a little bit about the medicine of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, there, there are uh, differences that I'll just quickly touch on. Ulcerative colitis is a colonic restricted disease, as Mark had mentioned before, particularly the left side of the colon. And its hallmark is that it's uniform, consistent involvement that I'll show you some images of. Whereas Crohn's disease can, as I like to refer to, affect stem to stern, any, uh, any aspect of the GI tract, and therefore has skip lesions, meaning some normal areas of mucosa uninvolved by disease, followed by diseased areas, whereas ulcerative colitis is uniform and does not have such skip lesions. Furthermore, Crohn's disease is what we call a transmural disease, um, as opposed to a mucosal restricted disease as in ulcerative colitis, the hallmark being in ulcerative colitis that diffuse pattern, the non-skipping nature of the lesions, whereas Crohn's disease, the hallmark is granulomas, although we don't see that in, in fact, even the majority of cases, uh, depending on the sampling, may not even show that granuloma. So the expert reading of that case is really critical to find the other signs 
that make the diagnosis. Clinical correlation is definitely necessary in both. Knowing where the biopsies were taking, what the mucosa, mucosa looked like endoscopically is critical in making an accurate histologic diagnosis. Um, and any good GI pathologist will need that information in order to provide the best diagnosis. Both diseases carry a risk of dysplasia and ultimately cancer, certainly more known in ulcerative colitis, uh, but both do have that. And then surgically, ulcerative colitis, those patients can progress to cancer and result in a colectomy in order to prevent cancer. While Crohn's disease, uh, I put the asterisk there just to indicate that while that is not the same type of surgery that is typically um, undertaken with Crohn's disease, certainly the extra intestinal manifestations like fistulas and other things can and do require surgery in Crohn's patients frequently. Here's just a, a colectomy specimen to illustrate an ulcerative colitis um, um, segment. So the left side of the bowel is all red, and then there's an abrupt line from that red diseased bowel to the tan and uninvolved mucosa as you extend into the transverse and then ascending colon and ileum. Whereas if you look at a Crohn's disease case, as in this one, you see that there's that tan mucosa that does appear normal, followed by and immediately adjacent to red areas and that cobblestone appearance, almost like cobblestone bricks, uh, where there's disease and non-diseased uh, mucosa all at the same time. And that is very typical of Crohn's disease. Histologically, just a couple of things. I'll point out ulcerative colitis image on the left. And you, I think even here, you can tell the difference between the normal and the abnormal mucosa, just a lot brighter, whiter on the right side in that normal slide. And that's because there are fewer inflammatory cells. The white goblet cells are preserved and intact, whereas in the ulcerative colitis, you see the inflammation building. There's even a crypt abscess and some mucifages next to the cell where the goblet cells have become dark because they've lost their mucin into the lamina propria high power view of a, of a granuloma in a Crohn's disease. But I would point out here simply that that mucosa around there, those goblet cells look nice. There are not very many inflammatory cells. This may be the only indication of Crohn's in certain cases. And one has to be very careful to be uh, uh, adept at picking these up in order to make a diagnosis, even in a challenging case like this. The FDA's view of histology has certainly changed and is changing. So currently, uh, the endoscopic healing of the mucosa is the standard and what people are looking for. However, the FDA has recently said very clearly that they are very interested in the histology. They want those, uh, those proposals submitted to them for comment so they can discuss. And they also want, uh, they make a note that the that these uh, scoring systems are challenging and that they want those to be robust and consistent and reproducible. So I think histology is continuing to come to the forefront and certainly made clear in a recent statement by the FDA. The EMA, on the other hand, re refers to the mucosal healing, healing as a primary stop. However, histology is a secondary endpoint. And there are longstanding data starting back into the 90s showing the value and benefit of histologic remission over endoscopic appearance. So this is not going anywhere. And I see this coming further and further ahead and being a key part of clinical trials in the future. This is just a, a quick slide to show some of the scoring systems. And Mark mentioned some of these. And there's no need to go deep into this. But I'll just point out that the words on the Gebo scoring, like mild and mild, moderate, those things cer certainly illustrate very nicely the human element and human limitation in scoring these cases. And it makes a great case for the layering on of whole slide imaging and artificial intelligence to try and remove some of that. Knowing what the scoring system is and that it is consistent both within a group and within a study is critical. And finally, need for expert diagnostics is, I can't emphasize enough, whoever you choose, if it's ProPath with our team of uh, 50 doctors or somebody else, you need people that are gastrointestinal pathology fellowship trained, not just somebody with 20 years of experience. And I like to speak of a 95 and 5% rule, and that is that 95% of cases can be handled by a solid, good, well-trained pathologist physician. However, it's the 5% that you're looking for. It's the 5% of cases that are missed or misdiagnosed by somebody with lesser training and lesser skill. Those are the cases that you really care about, and those are the cases that a, a good quality team can handle. And why do you need a broad team, a large team like the one we have? Uh, there, You need consensus and consistency. 
If there is dysplasia by uh, uniform agreement, dysplasia must be confirmed by another GI fellowship trained pathologist. So that is critical. And you need to keep a uh, level set among the group so that there is not a disparity among the humans that are reading the cases. And it also provides in our case an, a level of academic rigor where uh, physicians push one another in order to stay on top of their game and be the best pathologist they can. Trial purposes here at ProPath, we do not treat trials as a second uh, line of business. That is, a, we treat it exactly like our clinical line of business. That is, a case comes in and it gets signed out and turned around immediately. That turnaround time is critical. We do not place it below the level of clinical work. We treat it the same way and, and get cases completed in 24 hours. And the histology and its role in your trials is critical. So with that, I thank you very much and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Snyder, for the next part of the talk. Well, thank you very much, Corey. My name is Jack Snyder, and I'm a physician, scientist, and managing director uh, at the uh, Washington office of Cato SMS. Uh, now that you've been uh, introduced to the clinical and endoscopic and imaging and histopathological aspects of inflammatory bowel disease, I'd like to turn our attention to the evolving uh, IBD product development space and particularly focus on the evolution of clinical trial design. So at Cato SMS, our longstanding experience in GI trial designs and implementation convinces us that the time has come. The time has come to seriously consider moving beyond traditional trial designs to more pragmatic designs. So let's explore this evolution in the next few slides. Are we ready for pragmatism and real world evidence? This slide, uh, we've gone over some of the risk factors and the diagnostic strategies uh, very well by my colleagues, Mark and Corey. But I, this slide is to just remind you that we are seeing a global increase, a global increase in inflammatory bowel disease. So in that setting, we need to think long and hard about where we go and what maybe we should be thinking of changing in the current uh, developmental landscape. So you know now that IBD is complex, it can be severe, and that we have a shortcoming of the available therapies, which are largely limited to anti-TNF, anti-integrin, and anti-interleukin uh, therapies at the moment. We do have uh, JAK, uh, Janus kinase inhibitors on the horizon, uh, such as tofacetamib, uh, with a very short, but it has a short half-life and a rapid onset, and it lacks immunogenicity. Uh, so those can be advantages, but we also have IL-6 inhibitors, PDE4 inhibitors, and S1P uh, modulators in development. But we want you to think about whether or not the time has come to change the paradigm with a greater focus on personalized and mechanism-based therapy and how we might uh, take that into account as we develop our clinical trials. Well, we certainly want to think about the evolving landscape of biomarkers listed here as uh, aspects of how we use these results to select the best therapy for a specific patient, because the recent research is clearly indicating that different signaling pathways may play a role in the pathogenesis of IBD in different patients. Now, we know that randomized clinical trials need uh, patients with objectively assessed active disease, and we've told you how to do that, um, we, and who can do that. Um, we need objective and clinically significant endpoints, whether it be to reach deep remission or other endpoints. Again, we've given you some uh, good information about how you get that done. Um, but we also have to think about um, whether or not uh, we need trials with not only placebo comparisons, but other active comparators, including the available biologicals and small molecules. Um, let's remind ourselves of what the definition of remission is. This slide is to show you that there are a lot of similarities, but some subtle differences in this particular but continuingly important endpoint of remission. So let's keep let's keep that in mind that not not all the regulatory authorities are are, are standardized with regard to the definition of remission. Um, further on this, we, we see that um, there are uh, 
the, the male, male score is used by both agencies. Um, we need p uh, pharmacokinetic and pediatric studies. Um, FDA has its recommendations uh, for standardizing male scores. Um, EMA is treating that a little bit different. And certainly, uh, last but not least, um, we have uh, steroid-free maintenance of remission for at least a year as a secondary endpoint for FDA. Uh, but as uh, the FDEMA suggesting that steroid-free maintenance of remission for at least a year is a primary endpoint. So in this context, um, we let's remind ourselves that we know how to do placebo-controlled uh, trials. We know how to do non-inferiority trials, and we know how to do superiority trials, and we know that they each have their advantages and disadvantages. And yes, we have plenty of examples of these three traditional approaches uh, for uh, uh, IBD ther therapies. But the time we think has come uh, to seriously consider evolving from the traditional uh, efficacy uh, explanatory type of trial where we focus on ideal circumstances, the very best uh, uh, enrollees and, and hypothesis testing. We think that now this, that we, are, we are already moving uh, along a continuum to the more pragmatic trial where we look at real world evidence and where instead of efficacy, the focus is now on a broader patient population um, comparing various treatment strategies and going for effectiveness as our bottom line. And thinking about lots of different stakeholders and decision makers, uh, maximizing the generalizability of our results as opposed to the more traditionally rigid protocol. Um, so we're looking for a more broad as opposed to uh, a more selective inclusion of patients. And we are looking at more clinically relevant outcomes as we move along this continuum to pragmaticity or pragmatism in clinical trials. This is just another uh, way of showing you and comparing and contrasting pragmatic versus clinical trials. And we can look at the nature of stakeholder involvement, uh, subtle differences in research design, uh, our uh, outcome measures and, and our costs, our sources of data, how we analyze, and then the availability of findings. Uh, so there are some uh, important differences here, but for those of you that want to uh, look more into this, I invite you to look at uh, the emerging literature on this and look for yourself to see whether or not pragmatism is the order of the day. Um, recently from New England Journal of Medicine, another table looking at uh, or assessing the evolving role of pragmatism in clinical trials and focusing on such things as who should be eligible, how do we recruit, what is the better setting for a pragmatic trial, um, who are the stakeholders, um, what kinds of flexibility do we have uh, for delivering care and for, ad for our patients adhering uh, to the protocols. So these are, again, different ways in the literature now of looking at that there are, there are clearly those who are uh, speaking with louder and louder voices about the role of pragmatism in clinical trials. And yet another way of depicting um, and assessing how far down a given road from the center of this circle to the uh, perimeter here, how far down the road towards pragmatic clinical trial designs have you traveled with regard to eligibility or setting or the, the delivery flexibility or your follow-up or uh, your primary outcomes. Can we link these pragmatical, pragmatic trial designs and real-world evidence approaches in the IBD space? We know that FDA is increasingly uh, interested in real-world uh, evidence and designs to monitor. Um, certainly, uh, they moved this moved into this arena when it comes to post-marketing safety and adverse event assessments. Um, we know that healthcare is using uh, real-world evidence for coverage decisions and to develop guidelines and decision support tools. Uh, we know that product developers are using uh, real-world designs and evidence to support clinical trial designs, whether you want to call it the large simple trial or the pragmatic clinical trial. And, even, and pragmatism has even entered into the observational studies arena. 
and uh, as we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more in here and has already been alluded to, computers, mobile devices, biosensors are gathering and storing huge amounts of data that should allow us to better design, conduct, and analyze our trials, especially if we can take advantage of the emerging technologies and the emerging value of artificial intelligence to answer previously unanswerable questions. So yes, big data analytics has come to the inflammatory bowel disease arena, and we are feeding data uh, from a variety of sources, as you can see on the right side of this diagram, whether it be the electronic health record or imaging data or omics data or histopathologic data or uh, cohort study data, all of this raw data, uh, we are putting it into big data platforms and the output should be better phenomapping, better predictive risk models, be better public health and pharmacovigilance and drug repurposing, and yes, uh, precision medicine in the IBD arena. And you can see on the left side of this slide, the various types of projects that are ongoing uh, to develop the, and to explore the use of big data analytics in IBD research. This slide just alerts you to uh, the, the variety of studies, the types of technologies, the types of big data approaches that are being used, whether it be machine learning uh, off a host of different uh, types of data or Bayesian machine learning models or natural language processing uh, and a variety of applications. And uh, the, this list just happens to be applications of big data methods for the inflammatory bowel disease spectrum. Uh, another way to look at this, uh, re very recent paper from Nature, uh, on the right side, you see the, all the reasons listed for big data approaches in IBD research. Um, the bottom part of the right side of the slide, there are some limitations and challenges at the moment uh, for using big data research in IBD, but uh, things will improve and we will, we will get over some of these humps with time. Um, so I strongly recommend if you really want to look at the interface of big data and IBD, you look at this uh, very recent Nature paper. And finally, let's understand that FDA has reached out. Uh, it has uh, created, along with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and the PCORI group, um, a demonstration project, the so-called SPARC Inflammatory Bowel Disease Cohort uh, within a the, the research exchange platform known as IBD Plexus. Um, so stay tuned on uh, these types of collaborations and partnering, including with regulatory authorities, because we think this is where uh, the, the, the world is going when it comes to clinical research and product development in inflammatory bowel disease uh, arena. Uh, we have provided you a number of publications and guidance. The one, uh, this is, these are the source materials upon which uh, these slides are based. And with that, um, I'll uh, give it back over uh, to my colleagues and to Ms. Bliven uh, for uh, any questions and answers you, uh, any questions you may have, and hopefully some answers that we can provide. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining our webinar, Future Proofing Inflammatory Bowel Disease Diagnosis and Clinical Trials. We will now have a brief pause before we beginning our responses to your questions that have been submitted.